Let me start by saying, uh, giving you a piece of free advice, live life without fear. If you live life fearlessly, your life's experiences will be limitless. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. The main topic of uh, today's chat is entrepreneurship. And you know, doctors can be entrepreneurs. You can invest in restaurants, in farms, in medical clinics, and so on. So I hope it's somewhat re relevant. The first thing when you think about being an entrepreneur is to understand that, at least in the United States and perhaps elsewhere in the Western world, majority of startup companies fail. And they fail for a bunch of reasons, bad management, access to funds, wrong products, wrong business strategy, and all of that. But that once to succeed, succeed really well. So the first thing I would do is understand what your goal is. What is it that you want to build? Why do you want to build it? And how you are going to go about it? Now, having a goal in itself is not enough. You have to have a strategy to attain your goal. I, even today, have a yearly strategy. I have a monthly strategy. I have a weekly strategy and I have a daily strategy of what I want to accomplish. So every day I sit and write down what it is that I want to do that day. I have a yearly strategy and a, without, a goal without strategy is like a ship without um, rudder. You just sort of... Secondly, once you have your goal and strategy, literally write down what is it that you bring to the party, what is your core competency, what is your advantage, why would you succeed. It could be a variety of reasons, but you need to understand what you bring to the party, what is your core competency. And it doesn't have to be something that other people uh, don't do. It could be as simple as, I want to grow chili, in my family uh, farm, and this is how I want to sell it, this is how I want to market it, and so on and so forth. So understand your strategy clearly. Now many people will tell you, have a plan B if plan A fails. I say don't have a plan B, right? Because plan B will dilute your energy. Give it all and be prepared to fail. And if you fail five times, get up six times. Right? Failure is not a terrible thing. You learn more from your failure than you do from your success. Right? So no plan B. Understand what your edge or your competency is. And then be fearless. Think big. And if you fail big, there's always a safety net. Remember, we have tremendous advantages as Tamils. We have a strong family network. We have a safety net. And this is an amazing time. I've never been more optimistic about the North because the um, central government is weak right now. They need external funds. The funders are understanding what's going on. And the latest IMF proposals have one of the lines is the treatment, uh, the disbursement of funds and the treatment of minorities. This is good for Sri Lanka in the long term. So it's a tremendous, I think, time to be living and working in the northern and eastern province. Now, I went to Vietnam soon after the war was war had ended, and it was devastated. Bombings, Vietnamese were leaving in boats to US and Europe and everywhere. And one thing I noticed is that Ho Chi Minh City was more, much more busier after 5 p.m. than during the day. People cycling around, much like here, motorcycles, cycles, 
And I asked the tour guide, where are they going? And they were going to learn. They were going to better themselves. And today, Vietnam is the fastest growing economy in Asia, growing at 8%, right? better than China, better than Singapore, better than Malaysia. And the energy of the people was evident at that time. <coughs> so we have a tremendous platform to build on our thing. Now my father told me, and I, you may have heard this before from me, that you, spend, you should spend the first third of your life earning, uh, learning, the second third of your life earning, and the third, last third of your life giving. Now in my life, um, I've been fortunate to f do fairly well in life, and I've also experienced living in a room with three pairs of uh, clothes uh, in prison in Boston. And I, if a man's life is measured by his varied experiences, I will hold my, myself against anybody. One time I was flying in private jets, and at that time I was you know, in my, by myself uh, in a room. I could have avoided this if I cooperated with the US government and pointed fingers at other people. But then I couldn't have lived with myself. I had so many offers to cooperate and point, falsely point my finger because the unique thing of the US justice system is they charge you, they want high profile guys, and you can negotiate and point fingers at somebody else and they let you go. I had that offer. But I didn't do that. I spoke to my wife and she said, thankfully, that even if we have to go live in a one bedroom apartment, she's prepared to do that with my three children. I spoke to my father and my father said, if you didn't do anything wrong, fight this. Do not cooperate and do not be like Judas or do not point fingers. And I have no regret, not one bit of regret. They fined me, I didn't make any money. They trumped up charges. They fined me in total about $250 million. Right? But I'm standing, I'm smiling, I'm in my own country with my own people and life is very good for me. My experience, I've learned more from my failures than from my success. Let's say I win at something, I move on to the next thing. But if I lose, I sit and analyze it. Why? So I'm in the investment business. Every year, I make money in some stocks and I lose money in stocks. At the end of every year, I sit and look at the 10 most losses I've had. I don't look at the winners. And I, I try to learn from why did I buy this stock and why didn't I sell it at the right time. And I think if you don't take failure as a negative, as a positive, as a learning experience, you know, I think you will learn. You have to be mentally tough. As I said, you have to be fearless. And you can't live life scared. I think my fearlessness came from my father. He was born in Vadamaraji in a small town um, near Point Peter called Alwai. And he was a uh, son of a Tamil teacher, headmaster. Luckily, after he was the first from his village to go to university. And when he went to university, after he graduated, we didn't, he didn't have any connections. You know, in Sri Lanka, many times you have to have connections to get things done. He applied for a scholarship to study uh, accountancy in England. He went to England. When he came back, part of the deal was he had to work for the government. He came back in 1957. In 56, they instituted the single-only policy. But that wasn't what he had signed up for. So he came back to the government and said, I'm not going to learn Sinhalese because that was not the agreement. And they said, you have to pay back five years worth 
of expenses of living and studying in London. He said, okay. At that time, and he quit. At that time, his net worth was zero. Now he was negative something or other. And I used to ask him, why did you do that? And he said, because it's wrong. That was not the agreement. If it was the agreement, he would actually learn Sinhalese and do that, right? So all along his life, <coughs> he was strong and fearless. And so many of my siblings are also, you know, and he was my hero and remains my hero. So that's where you and he told me, if you didn't do anything wrong, you fight this. You know, this country, I mean, there are many more smarter guys than me that, that can explain what happened. But my feeling is, for the first time, the international community has got very active in Sri Lanka, the IMF, India, China, and Japan. And we can't fool these countries. These countries know exactly what's going on here. And there's, it's not a coincidence that they're talking about devolution before February 4th and talking about all these things. There's tremendous pressure in the central government to do the right thing. And so I think good things will happen. I just uh, spent with my wife and children a week in the south. And the Sinhalese people are wonderful, kind, caring, easy to smile, much like the Tamil people. So then you ask yourself, where is the disconnect? And there's only one word, politicians. You know, we know that in many countries there's corruption, but the level of corruption here is beyond the pale. And the amount relative to 